2020 was a year of transition as the United Kingdom severed ties with the European Union and Brexit became a reality. The deal reached Christmas Eve provides a new framework for how the UK and the EU will live, work and trade together moving forward. Dr. Andrew Glencross is a senior lecturer in politics and international relations at Aston University. His research focuses on European integration, including the Brexit negotiations, and issues to do with the Eurozone as well as international relations theory. Dr. Glenn Cross, thanks so much for your time today. My pleasure. The agreement came just at the very end of the wire, but I think we need to go back a few years to get to where all this began. It's always been a bit of a tempestuous relationship. What are the main issues that created those tensions? And how did that all play out through the referendum and the negotiations? So one word essentially, and that's sovereignty. And the way that played out in the years before Brexit was in relation essentially to two things. So there was a desire for more sovereignty about immigration policy, because under the terms of the EU treaties, you need to treat EU citizens effectively as if they are UK citizens. So that means you have to give reciprocal rights to come and work, live and study in the United Kingdom. So there's the immigration aspect of sovereignty. There's also what you can think about a kind of regulatory aspect of sovereignty, which is, do we want to be in a one size fits all model of economic regulation? Or maybe we want something different for financial services, a big commercial interest for the United Kingdom, of course. So the demand for sovereignty and doing things a bit differently came in those two main areas. And that was building up pressure because there's more pressure in the years before Brexit to regulate financial services. We've been through a global financial crisis. There's pressure to do that at the European level. And there's also more and more immigration from the rest of the EU into the UK. So there were pressures building up on both those fronts. And voter turnout was 70%. I mean, the decision to leave, not a slam dunk by any means. And there were some very stark differences in the way people voted across the UK. Scotland and Northern Ireland voted to stay. So what has happened to those divisions along the process of finalizing a deal? So the really extreme divisions, the people who really feel strongly about leaving the EU one way or the other, those opinions are still very strong. The opinions on the margins then are still very strong. People who really think this is a bad idea or people who think we need to support this at all costs because there was a fear up until the last minute deal that it might not even happen. The middle range position though is much quieter now because we've had the pandemic, we've got other things to be worrying about in terms of public health notably. However, if you dig a bit deeper, a lot of those big divisions remain. People who are graduates, younger people living in big urban areas, much more likely to be still favorable to the EU compared with older voters, rural areas, much less favorable, very happy now that Brexit has taken place. Well, it's been a long haul, four and a half years since the referendum. The 11 month transitionary period too, where everything remained status quo as a final deal was being negotiated. What were the stickling points along the way that brought it right down to the wire? Yeah, that was an odd period. So as you say, 11 months, we officially left the European Union, but legally it was as if we hadn't left. And in that time then, we were trying to negotiate the UK and the EU, the two parties, a free trade agre agreement. On that basis, the real sticking points were, what would be the conditions for having zero tariffs and zero quotas, which is a big ask. It's a good thing to have that when it comes to trading goods at least, but on what conditions? The EU was really playing hardball when it comes to saying we need in the UK to see then in return for those kind of free trade arrangements, what was so-called level playing field measures. So a commitment to keep certain levels of health policy, workers' rights policies, in order to make sure that there wouldn't be a kind of unfair competition from the UK if it got that trade deal across the line. Well, there are many elements to the deal, covering everything from fisheries to travel between borders. What are the most significant changes? Did the UK get everything it wanted from Brexit? Well, if you go back to that big word of sovereignty, it got a lot of sovereignty back to the degree that 
Europe's courts, the EU's court in Luxembourg, will not be able, in a sense, to bind the UK Parliament like it used to. That's really a big move towards sovereignty. The UK won't have to treat EU citizens as if they were UK citizens, won't have to give reciprocal rights about free movement, the ability to come and work and study. We are now sovereign in the UK to decide those things independently. We also have more regulatory sovereignty when it comes to how we decide to regulate banking or making widgets. However, we do have to accept that if we want to sell those things to the European Union, we have to follow a lot of EU rules in order to do that, whether that's for goods or services. Well, in the ongoing pandemic, as you were saying earlier, Sean, a spotlight on health security. It's been seen as a major priority by many. Did the final Brexit deal address that issue? And is there room for future negotiations in this area? So the health security component of UK-EU relations, it's a really good case study of what Brexit actually means, because we are going to go through a process of deinstitutionalization. It basically is a bit like unplugging your computer. You're not going to plug, be plugged into the same network as before, which means for information sharing, both sides potentially will lose out. The UK contributed a lot of information. It would receive a lot of information about pandemics, about health measures across Europe as well. So we're going to leave that model behind. And in its place, there's not a lot. It's very thin, that new arrangement. We have the right to ask for ad hoc, in a sense, access to some of the EU's health databases, but there isn't a lot to go on. And that's something to watch as a space for more negotiation. But then if we negotiate some more, it will look again to a lot of people like we're asking to rejoin, which in itself then is controversial. We're also talking about the music industry and creatives traveling across borders. Uh, that is also an issue that is looking, that, that many are looking to see renegotiated as well. So that's another thing that will be part of the to-do list now, that you leave the EU and yet you have a free trade deal, but that's incomplete. If you think about musicians, that's a service. They need to perform in person overseas. And in the EU context, they never had to worry really about a lot of the minutiae, business visas, tax implications, etc. That's over. So another good illustration of the barriers to trade created by Brexit. And there was an offer on the table for something reciprocal from the EU, but the UK didn't want to do that on the basis that it would then allow EU citizens who are musicians to do the same things. However, there's a lot of pressure to keep negotiating. So we're going to keep going back to some of these sticking points time and again. Well, there's no doubt Brexit is having an impact on all major industries, not all of them positive. But now that negotiations are done, what comes next? Is it all going to work itself out? Well, what comes next is, in a sense, a twofold process. There's the process of businesses in the private sector adapting to the new reality. But then on top of that, there's the government maybe having to respond to businesses and public demands as well to change that new reality to, in a sense, show perhaps the Brexit dividend or in the cases where there's not an obvious benefit, perhaps to renegotiate certain aspects of that relationship. But it's much harder to knock at the EU's door now that you've left and you are officially what is known as a third country than if you were within that system trying to renegotiate. And that's going to be a hard lesson in terms of how cold it is on the outside. Well, you were saying many of the younger voters voted to stay within the European Union. Is it possible down the road that we might see a reversal? Well, if you think that those younger voters, if they stay EU enthusiastic, let's say, EU supportive, then they might eventually constitute a majority. We do know that people perhaps become more conservative over time, so that there might be a cultural reason perhaps to be attached to Brexit and say, look, this is now the way we've been brought up, the way we've now adapted. And yet, if you think about politicians, the big promises made by the supporters of Brexit to say how great things would be if we could be more independent, if we regained sovereignty, took back control, if that doesn't materialize, if the benefits aren't obvious, then I think there'll be a lot of businesses, a lot of public pressure to reevaluate the basis of that relationship and maybe not rejoin at first, but certainly to get a closer and closer alignment in many ways. 
Well, I'm sure this certainly isn't the last we will hear of Brexit. Dr. Glenn Cross, thank you so much for your time and for providing us here at Newspoint 360 with a brief 360 on Brexit. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me.